So you know the, the rules. Um, questions addressing the entire panel or individual members, panelists can comment on each other um, and the, wait until the microphone arrives at your place. So my uh, question is for Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. Is there anything uh, left to be said for Hayek? <laughs> we're going to start the Civil War early here, right? Yeah. Uh, so, well, uh, yeah, I guess I, I'm sure, first of all, I should say that uh, I, I thought Hans's paper was br a brilliant invisceration of, of this aspect of Hayek and uh, absolutely necessary and, and, and fabulous. So, um, but yeah, there is, and I'm sure everybody else would, would, and Hans too would say there's another Hayek. And I've learned an enormous amount from, from Hayek and his social theory in particular. I think Joe Salerno would, you know, highlight his business cycle theory. For me, uses of knowledge in society is a brilliant paper. It's a, it's a great expansion of, of, of Ms. Essie's idea. And, I, and uh, one thing that's really neat about Hayek to me anyway is that he doesn't have this sort of Hobbesian um, uh, problem that, that Mises has. You know, Mises always said all the time that the government was the most essential institution. You know, it's, it's the one that we can't do without. And, you know, he would go on like this. Um, but uh, while Hayek, you know, finds himself recommending vast, vast government interventions, his social theory presumes a kind of anarchism that you can read into it. At least, at least that's why I read Hayek. And I think we would be impoverished if we just, you know, d dispensed with them all together. Uh, I guess you could say so. Yeah. I should make that clear. Yes, I owe Hayek something. I did. I did say that. Um, I think um, Hayek, because he is as well known as he is, is for many, many people up to this day. That is also refers also to Friedman. Uh, is the first step in in the right direction. Um, I also said, and I emphasize it again, that I consider Hayek. A, a very good economist, uh, but I did not talk about his e contributions to economics. I talked about those areas of his work that made him famous. Uh, there are very few people who actually read the economic treatises of Hayek. Um, I'm sure that the pure theory of capital by Hayek has been read by no more than two dozen people alive. Um, and uh, this is by and large also true for other books like Prices and Production. I remember Friedman saying in some, uh, some uh, conference that he couldn't understand a word of Prices and Production. Um, so, again, uh, my intention was not uh, to outlaw Hayek, so to speak. Uh, my, my intention was just to show that as a political theorist, he is a disaster. Um, and he can only be useful in the sense of opening the way for people who are on the search for something, and they will encounter him long before they will encounter Rothbard or Mises. Uh, and uh, in so far, of course, he is of great use. Um, I know many people who experience the same thing that I experienced myself. They read Hayek first and from then they marched on further and encountered better people or at least better political theorists than Hayek. Thank you. A uh, question for Mr. Tucker. How do you feel about the, I must say, no offense Benjamin, but rather uh, silly remarks we just heard earlier that uh, we enjoy our own slavery and we enjoy the state oppression just so we can talk about it and all of this is just uh, intellectual masturbation. Because to me, it sounded, uh, your speech earlier sounded like uh, a call for resistance, at least on a very individual level. Thank you. So, uh, you, ask, you were asking a question to me, is that right? Oh. So, I, I love Mencken. Uh, he's just a delight, uh, but uh, he his his uh, <clears throat> his pessimism was also. I'm not entirely sure how serious it was. I think it was um, also an attempt to delight the, the reader. Uh, 
uh, and I don't really share it in the sense that what, one of the things I think, think uh, Benjamin's paper left out and also Mencken left out is that statism doesn't work. This is a big problem for the state because it promises glorious things and they don't arrive. And, and yet people have to live their lives, you know. So, uh, so the, just, just because of the nature of things, there is a tendency for people to fly into resistance mode even if they're not, you know, uh, outright Rothbardians or, you know, adopting Locke and natural rights theory or whatever. They just want to have their clothes get cleaned or, or, or whatever the thing may be. So, yeah, there's always every, every intensification of the state gives rise to more uh, of this breaking bad phenomenon, of this rebelliousness, of, this, of, the, of the pirate economy. And to me, this is a great source of hope. Um, I don't see Mencken really having dealt with this at all. I mean, even if you just walk down to the markets down the street here and walk through the central markets, you can see uh, the place is filled with pirate products everywhere. And it's just fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's glorious. I mean, it encourages you because it makes you realize, look, I mean, the U.S. the evil empire is, is, is going all around the world trying to crack down on piracy. And they can't do it. They can't get away with it. So the more rebellion we have, the more piracy we have, the more breaking bad that takes place in the world. And it's going to increase the larger the state intensifies its regulations, its taxations, and, and all of the, the terrible things it does. Uh, the more we are able to create a kind of, you know, sort of an underground civilization of, of liberty that's more efficacious and lends itself to human flourishing to, to a much greater extent than the official world. And eventually, I, I think we can, we can see a future in which, which the statist apparatus is absolutely overwhelmed and, and devoured by this world that we are creating as individuals and in all of our little micro uh, rebellions. Can I comment on that? Um, uh, I mean, I think there's a, a very, uh, an almost total overlap between Breaking Bad and shit stirring. And, uh, and just a point about Mencken's pessimism, mostly it's pretty rational looking at what's happened in the past and saying that will happen in the future. So it's not saying that uh, things will become unbearably bad and that uh, government will, uh, will uh, increase constantly, saying you know, there'll continue to be a fight and tension, um, but there's no reason to think that we'll make any progress. And so it's pretty rational, just saying, look what's happened in the past, that will happen in the future. I mean, Mencken was you know, more famous than, like, than many of us, or all of us. You know, he was like the best-known journalist in America. Uh, yet, you know, government kept on increasing. You know, that's just, uh, that's just the way it goes. Uh, I must say, uh, I just want to say that there is quite a lot of fun to be derived from uh, government. I used to make a small income uh, from publishing in the New Statesman, which is a left-wing magazine in England, uh, the circulars that I used to receive in my hospital. I would just uh, publish them. <laughs> and uh, with very little commentary, uh, very little commentary was required. And... Um, I've derived, uh, I've written quite a few articles on things. I, we, we received a, um, uh, in, in the hospital in which I worked, uh, we received a form saying that, asking us for our race, uh, religion, and sexual preferences in order that uh, the personnel department could continue to pay us correctly. And uh, there were, I think there were 17 races and 12 religions, or it might have been the other way around, I can't remember. And, um, and there were six sexual preferences. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, wrote, uh, sent them a little note saying, uh, surely you've got a very restricted imagination if you think there are only six. <laughs> And uh, so there is uh, quite a lot of fun <laughs> to be had from, uh, um, from uh, the idiocy of government, I must admit. I've, I've had a great deal of fun from it. <laughs> Don't you think, Benjamin, that part of what... I, I perfectly agree with what Tony just said. I also watch the TV on these debates 
one smart guy talking to another smart guy being asked by a smart woman. I think this is just like a comedy show. Um, it, I also get great enjoyment out of just being able to predict what these guys will say <laughs> um, and what the counter arguments will be and how the whole debate will end. Um, so yesterday, I was, various people came and said, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist. I think it doesn't really matter. Um, I do what I like to do as long as they let me do it. Um, I, I hope that people will listen to me. Uh, if they don't listen to me, then I discontinue talking to them. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think uh, I'm, I'm happy with my life uh, Regardless of what will uh, come in the future, uh, as long, of course, as they don't incarcerate me. Um, but I'm op in that regard, I'm optimistic that will <laughs> likely that will likely not happen. Uh, hi, I have a question for Benjamin uh, regarding Mencken and his pessimism. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the page you created for Men Menger, well, sorry, Menke, Mencken. Uh, the Mencken Info or something like that, that uh, on that side the main picture is of Mencken being very joyous after the end of prohibition. So my question to you is, 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 is what was Menger, Mencken's uh, reflections on the ending of the, the prohibition, which was uh, obviously a great evil. So, so did he uh, felt uh, pessimistic afterwards that or was he optimistic <laughs> in his writings? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he was very active uh, during the calls for prohibition and during the introduction of prohibition. I think uh, I read somewhere that in the first 30 days of prohibition, every day he wrote an article against it. Um, and uh, you know, he would openly say that he's you know, you know, drinking bootleg whiskey or uh, whatever. And uh, definitely he was drinking all through prohibition. Um, so you know, I think it was just... Uh, you know, he was happy. That was a minor victory, um, but you know, like there were still taxes on alcohol and <laughs> plenty more. On, on prohibition, Mencken in his in his diaries, which is interesting, during prohibition, almost uh, almost every day he writes something on alcohol. He he doesn't write on that before and after prohibition. But during that time period, everybody was obviously obsessed about getting something to drink some, some place and informing each other where they would go, where the good bars would be, where you would get this whiskey or that whiskey. None of that played any great role before or afterwards. So I think this also applies probably to drug prohibition. Um, if it would be legalized, these things, hardly anybody would talk about it. Hardly anybody would notice that they had been um, uh, permitted. Um, but because of the fact that they are prohibited, uh, lots of people are simply obsessed by uh, getting drugs this type or that type or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, question for Hans. Uh, you, there's a very clear distinction uh, between illegitimate uh, force being the initiation of violence against personal property and legitimate right of defense. Um, under what circumstances, are there any circumstances in which preemptive attack is a legitimate force of defense, particularly if it's in response not to an overt but to a perceived threat, as was the case in Iraq and seems to be about the case in Iran? Those are, those are cases, I think, that have to be decided one by one. Um, uh, yes, things like that obviously exist where there is an impending attack uh, and, and you might react to this impending attack. But you obviously also realize immediately this, uh, that is a, a very dangerous concept because you can always come up with some impending attack from, uh, from someone and it would open the door to constant, to constant aggression. 
Um, and of course, every, uh, every war or every major conflict that has broken out was fabricated in such a way that it looked like there was an impending attack or you even organized some small uh, skirmish, uh, paid the guys to do the skirmish, and then you had a, a reason uh, to do the invasion. So again, I think that requires very careful scrutinizing of the individual cases. In general, I tend to think uh, uh, you, you, the, bur the burden of proof is on, on those who say there is an impending attack to show that that is really, really the case. Maybe, Stefan, uh, do you want to make a comment on, sure. on this thing? Uh, I agree with that that general uh, observation. And of course, in the case of states, the burden should be even higher. In a case of private defense, um, uh, maybe not quite as high. And then, of course, you could also argue that standing threats, which is a type of impending threat, someone who's proven by their previous actions they're just a complete menace to society, um, could be dealt with. I suspect that in a free society that uh, standing threats or impending threats like that would be dealt with somewhat procedurally by ostracism or something like that. Uh, but on occasion, you're going to have some, someone who's going to take law into their own hands if they don't see some progress being made. And they might uh, just take the guy out. And then thereafter, this guy might be viewed as sort of a little bit of a standing threat because he's not following the rules exactly. But on occasion, in egregious enough cases, you can see something li like that happening. But I think, by and large, it would be pretty rare to do it because the burden of proof would be high that you'd have to resort to. A question for Dr. Daniels. Uh, if it's okay to, to go back and bring up a discussion from two days ago, I, I would love to hear the opinion of a successful author who went with a, a standard publisher on sort of the evolution of the publishing industry and, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of each, uh, each course. Um, well, I'm afraid your question is um, uh, based on a false premise that I'm successful. <laughs> I mean, as uh, somebody said, uh, uh, the, rare, my, the rare editions of my books are the second editions. And... Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, I suppose that, uh, I've, of course, I've always gone through publishers. I've had great difficulty actually getting uh, uh, published in England uh, in up till fairly recently. Fortunately, the costs of publication have come down, and I had great difficulty in being published at all by any major publisher because I, I, I think genuinely it must have been for reasons that they didn't like uh, the content of what I wrote um, because... Uh, it was impossible that they would fail to make a profit from uh, my books. So I had great difficulty. Uh, I've always gone uh, through them. Um, I suppose in the modern world now they will act as some kind of filter or guarantee of some... This is, will be the, their claimed role, their... Um, their um, uh, some kind of guarantee of uh, quality. In my case, of course, I, I, I don't think I need that anymore because there would be people, if I self-published, the, the uh, 612 people who buy my books uh, would probably buy them and I would cut out the uh, publisher. Um, I haven't really got anything uh, to say uh, other than uh, I continue to go through publishers because of inertia, mental laziness and inertia. Um, and, I, and, of course, when you sell 612 copies, it doesn't really matter how you're published. It doesn't make much difference. Will you tell us how many copies you really sell? Was it not 613? 
<laughs> well, uh, there, there have been books, I must admit, that I have sold. There are, some, there are a couple of books where I've sold 40,000 copies. But that's over a period of 10 years or something like that. So or a book that's remained... In, there are wonderful things for a publisher, uh, for, for someone like me now, that all the books that, um, uh, all the books that uh, I've written, which would never have been republished, are now being republished as Kindle editions. Uh, and presumably, so long as the, that continues, I will, uh, my books, which otherwise would have disappeared completely, will uh, go into the, uh, will be available forever. But unfortunately, that is true of everyone else's books. <laughs> <laughs> Any other I, questions? I don't really have anything uh, much to say um, on the subject. Hi, can I ask uh, Professor Hopper um, about Hayek? Why do you think he was so unsound? He's, his main teacher was Mises, and yet he remains unsound and is ripe for plunder by social democrats. What, why was Hayek um, so mistaken? Thank you. His, his teacher, Mises, Mises was his teacher only as far as his economics is concerned. Um, and I think that is the area in which he excelled. Um, uh, his excursions into the area of political philosophy came much later in his life when he had been long separated from, from Mises and probably fell under the influence of other people. I personally do not know uh, who those people might have been. Um, um, but he, um, uh, he has, in, in the area of political philosophy, he displays a fundamental anti-rationalism. Um, he, he, he does not think that reason can accomplish very much. Um, but that, of course, he tries to reason. Um, so I think even there in his anti-rationalism, uh, t constant talk against reasoning, uh, there is some sort of muddled mind at work um, because what is the purpose of writing, trying to persuade people uh, of his arguments unless he does trust uh, in reason? Otherwise, he should not say anything. Um, but I have no... I have no answer to uh, why Mises did not have a greater influence on him also in the areas of political theory than, than he did. He, uh, I th if I may say, he was very interested in John Stuart Mill, wasn't he? And he edited the uh, letters of John Stuart Mill to his wife. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which might have turned his... And John Stuart Mill was also a very muddled thinker. Uh, and his wife Harriet was an ardent socialist. Um, and that was the least of it. <laughs> <laughs> you, tell, you, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was obviously a masochist, and, uh, in the most literal uh, sense. And, um, and, uh, and she was extremely nasty to him. And he liked that. He liked that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe a follow-up question to that. Is it right that uh, Hayek was converted by Mises' um, book, Socialism? And pre pre previous to that, he was a socialist. And isn't it the case that um, for many, not for all, but for many people who convert from socialism to s something else, they retain some some form of socialism. The neoconservatives are ex-Trotskyites. Um, and so it may have been the case with Hayek. Is, is, is that but, then, but then Mises was a lefty himself also. Yes. And, as I said, and he, all, he converted himself to something entirely different. <laughs> yes. And, uh, uh, not all were... Uh, um, sorry. Uh, some, of course, made the whole transition, like Mises. But for a lot of people, it is difficult. They want to keep something that tells them 
I was right in some way before. They didn't want to dismiss themselves. Is that maybe I, the case? I think we should not uh, engage in too much psychologizing. It's like, you see, I mean, we'll, I take Hayek at his word. I mean, this, this is what he writes, and I attack that or find it good or whatever it is. Why he did this or so. Um, Tony would be more qualified. He is a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't, I, I don't pretend to know what goes on in the minds of these people. All I see is the output on paper. Thank you. I have a question to you, Dr. Daniels. Um, you told us that uh, you consider people in the Western world to have a free lunch, uh, to live in a free lunch uh, society, to have a free lunch syndrome, if I quote you correctly, and that many people are rent seekers. Um, you as a psychiatrist, um, do you think that people are uh, mentally ready for freedom and liberty now? Uh, uh, well, there's that famous uh, quotation from uh, Macaulay who said if you wait till people are ready to free for freedom before they are free, they, they'll never be free. Um, there, it's certainly true that a lot of people don't like freedom, at least in our society. And uh, for example, to give you an example, uh, about, 30, about a third of the prisoners that I saw in prison, um, uh, preferred life in prison to life outside. And, um, and that must be so, because in order to be caught by a British policeman, you must really make quite... <laughs> <laughs> you really have to uh, you know, beg him to arrest you and things. So, um, uh, and I used to take them aside and say confidentially, uh, "Do you like? You've been in prison several times before. Do you like life in prison?" And they would say yes. And the re there were the reasons that they liked prison was that they wanted freedom actually from themselves. They didn't trust themselves. They also didn't want uh, women. It wasn't that they were homosexual, but their relations with, with women were so com conflict-ridden that it was a relief to be in prison where there were very few uh, women. So there are substantial numbers of people who don't want much in the way of freedom. And... Um, whether uh, what that means for society as a whole, I don't know. But these are people who have grown up in a, generally speaking, have grown up in a, a world without much structure, uh, without much love, and so on and so forth. And they actually find uh, more decency in prison than outside. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible indictment, but, but that's how they are. Um, so I'm not sure what that means in a society of 60 million people in Britain, that there are many people who don't want uh, freedom. They definitely, uh, many, many do not want responsibility because it's very difficult. Responsibility is difficult. I have a question to um, Mr. Daniels. Um, the, uh, in the works of... Uh, Talking to the microphone. Yeah, okay. In the works of um, Socrates and also Hegel, if you might know, the, the main feature which is distinguishing human beings from animals is uh, timus, or timus, I don't know the spelling, is that the wish to be recognized and respected. And also, for me, it means an opportunity of making a choice. And this is something the democracy, I would say, is um, an idea or uh, it's that is making an illusion of being respected, recognized, and having a choice. So I would say that it's rather um, the, the, cho the illusory choice without consequences. And this is exactly where I see the weakest point of the whole construction where um, the, the most enormous changes could be made. Uh, I, I I'm not quite sure what the, the, my question, the question is. Yeah, my, my question is that it is in the very nature of the human being to seek for being recognized and heard and uh, respected. So I would say that there is a big chance of um, pushing on that exactly point and uh, change the attitude to the whole political system as well. Well, I, I suppose it, me it depends whether you mean uh, one is self 
uh, self-consciously looking for respect or, or, or whether uh, it's a, an inherent thing that you wanted. The idea of self-consciously looking for respect is, is disastrous because, in my view, it ends up in intimidation. You will give me respect or otherwise. I mean, that's what respect has come to mean in, in the areas where I practiced, for example. Respect meant you will do what I do, what I want, or you will cringe before me because if you don't, I will be violent towards you. That's what respect meant. That's what recognition meant for them. And the other thing of, uh, I mean, self-esteem is another dreadful quality. Um, people would come to me and say, I, I have no self-esteem. And I'd say, well, at least you've got one thing right. <laughs> <laughs> and the... <str> <laughs> And the strange thing is, instead of becoming very angry, they started laughing because, because they knew the whole concept was bogus. The, the, there's a huge difference between self-esteem and self-respect. And self-respect is what it has, and self-respect is a very valuable quality because it's a social quality and so on. Self-esteem is actually saying, I love myself, whatever that actually means. I, or I like myself, irrespective of what I actually am or what I do or what I mean to other people. And unfortunately, that kind of uh, thinking has uh, become very widespread. You're talking about self-esteem, Tony, are you familiar with Nathaniel Brandon, for whom self-esteem is the highest goal in life? <laughs> um, uh, well, I pity him. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hülsmann recently had an excellent lecture on exactly on the argument of the relationship between Mises and his nasty students. Uh, so uh, I would very much uh, like that you give us a synthesis of what you said in your lecture in Prague. I think it could be interesting for our debate on Hayek and, and, and Mises. The lecture in, uh, in Prague, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, guys. <laughs> I try, try to be brief. Yeah, the lecture uh, uh, concerned um, uh, the, the role that Mises played in the, the Mont Pelerin Society. Actually, that was a talk that I gave here in the, in the Property and Freedom Society six years ago, and so a variant of this, I did this in Prague because it's still not published, so that's what academics do. If you don't have much time, you're just given the same talk, or a variant thereof, a second time, because it's not yet published. So in, in that uh, lecture, I explained that uh, uh, Mises was very skeptical uh, concerning the uh, future evolution of the Mont Pelerin Society because it was infused with social uh, democrats, in particular, Willem Röttke, Maybe he also thought of Hayek. Uh, Hayek had not yet published the Constitution of Liberty. So he said, well, if we, we start from the outset, we're discussing whether the income tax should be 25% or 30%, and that cannot be the, uh, the point of a libertarian congregation. So learning from this was precisely one of the reasons why Hans Hoppe uh, took the initiative a few years back to, in order to set up uh, this society in which we would not spend our time on uh, scheming out the, the, the best way uh, interventionist policies could be arranged, but set out in completely free from such constraints discussing all uh, fundamental uh, questions pertaining to uh, liberty and the unnecessary uh, nature of the government and try to have fun doing this. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Does the panel want to say anything to this? Uh, right. um, any other questions? I have a question for uh, Professor Daniels. Um, uh, there is a quite famous uh, on the YouTube uh, internet uh, uh, anarchist uh, philosopher, uh, Stefan Molyneux. And one of the things he does is he promotes very heavily is, is uh, stopping uh, beating children. 
or you know, spanking the children in, 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 at home. So uh, it, it, for him, it's the key to uh, reach a you know, better world in the future or anarchist world in the future if, if children don't get uh, punished. So uh, they, they will not grow up thinking that uh, uh, violence is a solution to whatever kind of problems. So I would like to hear uh, your reflections on, on, on that idea. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, in a word, I think it's nonsense. <laughs> because uh, I, mean, I don't want to set myself up as a great example in the world but I remember being spanked once or twice and I've never been violent myself and I don't, I'm not a saint or anything like that but I don't think I'm a particularly bad person and um, I, it's not that I'm in favour of uh, violence towards that kind of thing but I think the idea that if only parents would stop uh, um, uh, hitting their children, everything would be all right. It seems to me preposterous. Uh, because, uh, children, uh, unless, you, unless you regard the state of the world as so catastrophic that, it's, uh, that all, the, all the past is nothing but a, a, you know, a sink of misery and so on, I don't really think that's true. I, I don't see it as, a, as the solution. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was spanked too. Um, is she, I mean, it's here. It's here. In, it's here. <laughs> when? <laughs> is, is, there, is there anybody here who never got spanked at all by their parents? I, I mean, maybe there are some wondrous cases. I mean, um, I will not ask you to raise your hand, but um, I, I think most people. Occasionally you get spanked. I said, Nothing happens. Seems to be perfectly normal. I, I think I would be strange as a parent if I wouldn't do it. Let, let me say something. Um, from the libertarian point of view, I think the way to analyze it is to view the parent. You have to view children as having full rights. And of course, if you hit someone normally without consent, it's aggression, even if it's minor. But the proper way to view it is the parent is the guardian of the child, and because of the natural relationship, the parent is presumed to have basically agency powers on behalf of the child. He can make decisions for the child, so he could consent to a type of surgery, tonsil, tonsillectomy, uh, maybe uh, circumcision, etc. <laughs> Whether you agree with it or not, but the point is the parent has the ability to make decisions on the child's behalf as his, as his uh, agent or caretaker. Um, unless the decisions are so egregious that you would presume that now the parent is not acting on the child's behalf. And in that case, you would say we no longer have the presumption that the child would grant this person, because of the natural relationship, the right to be the caretaker of the child, uh, such as in cases of child abuse. Uh, but in my view, spanking is one of those optional areas that is within the, the parent's this right to make the decision, whether it's a good idea or not. And I personally think it is not a good idea. But that's not as a libertarian. That's just as a certain parent parenting style but as maybe, a libertarian maybe you're lucky with your kid that's <laughs> <laughs> I, I was i was spanked too i i, I must say i i deserved it many times <laughs> over the course of the last few days we've heard a lot of diagnosis of what's wrong with the state and what to avoid and and we've seen what not to do and throughout that we've also caught a few nuggets of wisdom on, on what to do. For instance, always use cash, make fun of the state, and in a sense show that the emperor has no clothes. Ask childlike questions of the status. Break bad and find life hacks. Restore the law by undoing legislation and now the most recently endorsed spanking of children. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other action steps that we can advocate coming out of the conference? Uh, try to make a lot of money. <laughs> that's one way to protect yourself from the government it's just one, one way you know I'm, I'm astonished as a, as a book publisher I get, I receive manuscript submissions like practically every day uh, sometimes two and three books a day uh, but you know seven out of ten of these are introductions to libertarianism or introductions to some aspect of, uh, like introductions to you know, free market economics. Um, and I can, I can tell you that we really don't need any more of these. 
think we've, we have plenty of these. But what I don't see enough of are really well-written, well-researched books on, uh, well, history, of course, but I think, very crucially, on, on the life of our times. Uh, you know, where's, where's our sort of anarcho-capitalist book on the group Anonymous? Where's, where's our, our book uh, understanding WikiLeaks and coming to the defense of WikiLeaks? Where's our book on international piracy? Um, th there's, uh, there's still not been a very good, uh, I think, detailed book on what's happened to banking since, since 2008. Uh, you know, I could just go through the list, and we could just go through the newspaper today and see all the incredible trends that, trends that have... Or how about a book just tracing the, the, the relationship between the re federal, central bank's response to 9-11 and the, the boom years of 2008, speaking of something, you know, just purely economic. But there's so many topics that could be... Unfortunately, these require a lot of research and a lot of time and a lot of work and some competence as a writer, but there's a tremendous opportunity for publishing right now for, for all of us us in this room, if we're willing to do the work that's necessary. I was at the fishing village last night, I looked around and I thought, wouldn't it be just fantastic to have a really well-written and interesting history of this village from the point of view of libertarianism? I mean, that would just be a great, I mean, everything is open, but it's, but it's got to be concrete and real, and it, it takes more work than just sitting down and spinning out yet another introduction to libertarianism. Okay, so there's a lot of work uh, Leslie Fair Books is, is open and ready to do business with anybody who writes serious works that are engaging, factual, uh, that actually look out the window, deal with reality in our, in our times, and explain our times in a way that animates the theory uh, and, and makes it more compelling and, be and believable. Those are the books we need. So there's a lot of opportunities for writing, I would su su suggest. I have a question to uh, Stefan. Uh, do you think in a free society, uh, something like uh, Gresham's law, which says good money drives out bad money uh, for the law itself, good law drives out bad law, and if yes, what kind of love, uh, law would that be, would you think? Um, I think so in a sense. Um, Imagine a free society with a host of private competing defense agencies or insurance companies or however it would shape out. And you have uh, some of them that tend to form intercompany agreements, treaties basically, like how we settle a dispute if we have customers that have a dispute with each other. And if they work something out, then they settle it by those rules. If they don't have something worked out, then there could be war or violence or at least a long protracted non-settlement of the dispute. Now, the customer shopping for a company, he would tend to choose the company that's got agreements with more companies because he knows there's a higher chance of working things out peacefully or of a good resolution or of a lower cost in the long run. So in a sense, I think these cooperative, you know, non-warlike types of agreements between companies would tend to be favored because the companies that didn't do that are not going to get many customers. They're going to, they're going to get the belligerent customers and their premiums are going to be higher. And belligerent people tend to be less successful in life and won't be able to afford it. So in a way I think basically for the same reason that war is costly and that violence is costly because it's not productive, it's destructive. Um, these types of economic pressures will shape and drive the types of laws uh, that these agencies enforce. That's just one example, but I think we can think of others too. Any other questions? No other question? Okay. In that case, I'll. Oh, there's one? It's a question for uh, Anthony Daniels. Um, what, in what way did your opinion about the interference of government in people's life change after you first uh, discovered the most important things in the first years you worked as a physician? How did, did it change in the decades after that? Um, well, I began to uh, see the effects 
of, uh, of a kind of dependency. And you couldn't really miss it where I was working. And one very interesting thing was that uh, in the ward in which I worked, I've told this story many times, and I'm sorry if I've said it here before, but we used occasionally to get uh, doctors seconded to us who came from Bombay or Manila. And initially, when they saw everything, they thought, this is wonderful. Everyone is looked after uh, in, um, very well. Um, we attempt to help them with all kinds of things. Um, but after about uh, a few weeks, they would see a sickness in it all and actually come to the conclusion, well, they'd come from places like Bombay and Manila, which are certainly not um, paradises, uh, they would come to the conclusion that from the human point of view, actually it was worse than what they'd seen in Bombay and Manila, which is saying quite a lot, I would imagine. So they saw a kind of, uh, I described it as a listlessness. So it was my observation, really, of that, and trying to see or trying to think about why, why this developed, how this developed, um, in circumstances where people were actually not, uh, I mean, they were relatively poor to the, by comparison with middle classes, of course, in the country, but they were not poor in any absolute sense. And so that, that's what made me start thinking about it. I have a question for uh, Benjamin. Did I understand you earlier uh, correctly that you said um, there's not been much progress uh, in, in, in fighting for freedom over the history of mankind? Um, but is this true? Um, do, do, do the fact that we've had such technological progress since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which didn't happen from nothing, it was because there was preced preceded by um, uh, an increase in personal freedom. So there has been a success, obviously, and it's being reverted, in the words of Ayn Rand, by an anti-industrial revolution. So should we be really so resigned that nothing can change in the light of the history? Um, well, I, I mean, certainly so technological progress, you know, we all as a, as, a, as a manifestation of previous freedoms. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that argument can be made. I mean, like, so we're talking, you know, you can have a big list. You can have a one-sided list of reasons to be optimistic, but then you think of other reasons, like, you know, the technology, the government uses it to track down our incomes and... and uh, make it easier for them to collect taxes and whatever. Um, so, you know, definitely it's not totally bleak. And, you know, um, um, yeah, so and, and you say be resigned. Um, um, I think, uh, I don't think resigned's the proper term to describe Mencken, like he... Uh, you know, he was as active as can be. He was, like, more prolific than anyone. Um, um, but it, it's, a, you know, there's no clear, clear, you know, you find someone, you argue with them, most likely it doesn't work. Or if you do convince them, it turns out a year later they're, uh, they're arguing something else. So, uh, yeah. I think it's also not correct to say that the Industrial Revolution was a result of increased freedom. Um, there existed as much freedom uh, in whatever, 1400 or 1300 as existed in, in, the, 18th, in the 18th century, uh, and the Industrial Revolution br didn't break out. There was not there were not dramatic institutional reforms that occurred around 1800 when the Industrial Revolution broke out. There's simply no evidence for this. Uh, I tried to explain in my in book, in one of the chapters, that that was the, the growth of human intelligence that took place in the course of thousands of years 
that made it possible that you had enough uh, smart people who could come up continuously with new, inno with new innovations and that uh, humans for a long period of history were not capable of doing this sort of thing. Again, if it is true that an increase in freedom brought about the Industrial Revolution, then people should show me what these institutional changes were that occur occurred around the year of 1800. And I don't see any of that. So it must have other causes than this. Thank you. Well, um, I wouldn't know to whom to address, but um, I think that the the word of collective uh, corruption uh, obviously seems to be a concept that also could apply for us uh, in here or, uh, or a question how, how uh, can corruption uh, show up? Uh, we heard there are doctors who, who get their salary of, of governmental funds and uh, uh, how, how then does it show up? Uh, corruption in, in our case or is innocence on the other side of corruption uh, a, a thing that we can uh, achieve as a goal and, and how could we, could we as a, an individual try to, to, to gain as much out of this and this having fun as a, an element of, of our motivation can we uh, somehow gain something out of it or a practical hint as well uh, how can we keep innocence, or is this in general something that, that we should attain as a goal, and how does it then show up as, a, as a, the, the contrary to the, to the corruption element? I don't know uh, whom uh, I could address with this question. Thank you. That's a difficult one. Um, I, g I guess the only way you can do it is just try yourself to lead an exemplary life and through your own life um, persuade people to imitate what, what you are doing. I, I can only improve myself, I cannot improve other people. Um, so just don't be corrupted yourself. Um, try to be an honest man. Uh, uh, try to be able to say all the things that I did were by and large right. I made mistakes here, I made mistakes there. Um, I see nothing else that can be done. Just to be, to try to be good yourself. Uh, strive to improve yourself and hope that other people will see that you do it and they imitate what you do. Any other words of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, they, uh, perhaps Confucius was right when he said that we must insist on words being used correctly. And one of the things that's very conspicuous in, in my country anyway is the constant misuse of words where they have connotations but no denotations or they, um, they come to mean the opposite of what they appear to mean and so on and so forth, and to try and resist that. And also... In, uh, <clears throat> in Britain, I, I can't speak for other countries, uh, people are actually very afraid now. Uh, and they are, uh, in my view, unnecessarily afraid or more afraid than they actually need to be. So there's a lot of fear which you can try and... because nothing much is going to happen, actually. I'll give you another example. Uh, an, a, a, a friend of mine, a professor... Uh, this is very similar to the the the, uh, the, uh, uh, the thing I said before. He gave a, a little talk at London University, and uh, he was uh, he had his expenses. He wasn't paid any uh, fee, and he uh, he was sent a form, which again asked him for his sexual proclivities. And he uh, before he could be paid his expenses, uh, presumably some. 
uh, proclivities are more expensive than others. I don't know <laughs> whether they thought he, he indulged in them en route. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, they were his travel expenses. And he wrote back and said, uh, well, uh, I want to know your sexual proclivities first. Uh, so you send me your sexual proclivities, I'll send you mine. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, of course, they decided that actually it wasn't necessary to know his sexual proclivities before paying him. Um, they didn't apologize. But I don't, I, I mean, this is a particularly absurd thing, but we don't resist enough. I mean, I can remember um, uh, uh, being phoned up, uh, phoned by my administration in my hospital. This is a state hospital. They said, you haven't sent your activity returns. And I said, uh, no, that's true. I haven't sent any activity returns. I can either have activity returns or activity. <laughs> Which would you prefer? <laughs> and, uh, well, there was a bit of a puzzled silence, and I said, no, I, actually, uh, I haven't uh, filled in my activity returns. I'm not going to fill them in. I'm never going to fill them in, and my decision is final, and you have no appeal against it. And um, I didn't hear any more. And I don't think enough people do that kind of thing. Not, and nothing happens to you. An another example I, mean, I gave from my prison, uh, the uh, the uh, chief medical officer uh, received a, um, a form every six months which said they wanted to know how many needles had been uh, used in his needle exchange scheme in the prison. And we didn't have a needle exchange scheme and we didn't want one. And uh, so he taught me a very good lesson. He picked this form up like this as if it was something extremely filthy just dropped it in the waste paper basket and said, if I, I'll get another one in six months' time and I'll do exactly the same, but if I so much as put a mark on it, anything on it, I will never hear the end of it. So there are all kinds of little things that we can do, provided that we are not afraid. But I, I'm not saying that that's going to make an enormous difference, but, but we should not be as afraid, those of us who are employed, as many of us are. In terms of filling in forms, Nev Kennard had a good line when a bureaucrat would come to him and tell him, you know, you need to fill in this, this form. Uh, he said, no, I don't need to, you know, you need, you need to have it filled in. And he'd try to do that. It never worked, but, you know, he would just extend the uh, length of time the form filling took. It's not just governments that are like this, of course. It's uh, large companies are exactly the same as governments. And uh, sometimes um, uh, uh, a bank or an insurance company or something would phone me up and say, uh, we are the bank, and, so on. and they'd say, uh, we need to ask you some security questions. And I said, are you sure it's not the other way around? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you never get anywhere. <laughs> I would uh, add, um, Hans is exactly right and uh, about the power of attraction, living an excellent life, and uh, Albert J. Nock and Leonard Reed have both written a good deal on this in a passionate form. I've got a blog post somewhere in the Ethernet, uh, internet uh, on this. Um, and the second thing, echoing Professor Dalrymple's thoughts, um, um, I would say, you know, don't pretend. Uh, you know, they can tax us, but they can't force us to admit that it's not theft. Um, you don't have to be a bore. You don't have to be rude in someone else's home. But if someone asks you a question or they say something that makes it appear that everyone at the table agrees with this statist idea, if they ask your opinion, you can be truthful. You can be polite. But you can say, no, I believe it's theft. I'm completely opposed to it. That's one thing we can do. And then finally, as for corruption, uh, of course, corporations, of course, these are largely in bed with the state, the insurance companies, and uh, being bailed out by the taxpayers and the, uh, the banks especially are a quasi-arm of the state. But by and large, of course, there's a cost to corruption in the private world. So the more private sector activities we have, the less corruption there will be because there's a cost in general. There's a, at least a general pressure against corruption inside 
the private sector. So we have to push for more private sector, less public sector. You know, there's another, another point to make. It just occurred to me that, <clears throat> you know, one of the strange things that the modern sort of civic religion does is it, ta it takes, it changes our sense of what we should feel guilty about. Um, so, for example, the uh, civic culture wants us to feel very guilty about, about mixing metals with glass or something in the, in the trash, you know, or taking too long of a shower or, um, you know, cranking up the hot water too much or something like that. So you have all these kind of civic sins that, we've, that are imposed on us. And it's very successful. People have a sense of, of guilt about all sorts of things if they... Um, but anyway, secular, secular modern civic life gets, gives, a, gives us a full catechism, you know, that we have to obey, and probably, uh, you know, confessionals are next. But, uh, so one of the things we can all do as individuals is to straighten out a sense of what we should and shouldn't feel guilty about. Like, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, feel, shouldn't feel bad at all about, about using phosphates, you know, for example, or um, we, sh we shouldn't uh, w worry about you know, swatting, um, swatting down bug bugs and spraying DDT on them or, or anything else. Anything, anything that preserves and, and helps our own lives flourish um, is, is a good thing. And if the state tells us not to do it, we should just say to hell with them and, and not, feel, not feel bad about it. And actually arriving at this um, way of thinking can be very liberating for you because you can feel a sort of distance from the official... Uh, fake moral code that the state gives us. And you can feel, you know, uh, an alternative, authentic, robust moral code developing within you, you know. And this is a kind of a lifetime thing. We're having to constantly fight against uh, false, phony ethical systems imposed by the state uh, bias. So this is a, a fantastic uh, way towards self-empowerment and self-liberation. Well, yes, and speaking as a former prisoner, I, I can tell you that it's, it's, it's not all, all terrible. And you do, you do meet some very interesting people in prison. <laughs> it's true. It's all good. Uh, a question to Anthony Daniels and Stephen Kinsella. Uh, Dr. Daniels, uh, you said that uh, there's no hope without fear. Uh, would you go as far as saying that uh, you'd have to instill fear to awaken the hope? And uh, what uh, you mentioned as well that uh, one third of prisoners aren't actually afraid of uh, prison, just to prefer it uh, from life outside. What kind of consequences uh, would still uh, be feared uh, in given the current mindset? And uh, a question to uh, Stephen: What kind of consequences would be? Legitimate, uh, in particular, given the likely case that the wealth that has been unjustly extorted by political and legal means has already been consumed and there's nothing left to take back. You, um, you, you start. <laughs> Could you just remind me the first leg of your question? Sorry, just briefly. Do you have to instill fear to awaken hope? Was the first part and. The question is, what kind of consequences would still be feared, given the, the mindset that you ah, so yes, aptly yeah. described? Um, well, I, I do think that fear is necessary, and I'm, I'm driven partly by fear myself. Um, uh, uh, and I, I don't see how they can be uh, um, uh, uh, completely... Uh, if you believe that actually the, the meaning of actions must be have some connection with the result, then obviously fear is built into that idea, I think. And, and part of the problem is that people have nothing much to... F that they know that they have to fear. They, they, I mean, they actually do have things to fear because their lives are not very good. As to the, uh, uh, as to the problem with uh, the prison, the prisoners who don't fear prison, I'm certainly not in favor of making prison harder than it is. But this observation that people uh, like going into prison, some people like going into prison, uh, isn't actually dependent very much on the actual... Uh, regime in the prison. So even when it was much harder in, when I started working in the prison, it was actually much harder uh, than it than it became. Uh, but even under the harder conditions, quite a lot of people uh, like prison. As you said, they met very interesting people. And um, 
um, uh, as to uh, what people should fear, I think it must be the consequences of their own actions. And unfortunately, there is this disconnection. I'm not in favor of uh, you know, uh, uh, terribly harsh things that would happen to them, but the consequences of what they do, are, it's very important. Um, let me restate your question to make sure I have it right. You're asking what is the remedy available to the victim of some type of aggression if the aggressor doesn't have enough property for restitution? So my approach is uh, justice is the idea that we're all in favor of. Justice means giving someone their due. Okay? What your due is de de depends upon what your property rights are. And as libertarians, we think that's basically the right to the physical integrity of your body and the things that you own, uh, which is why we're against aggression. Um, the idea of restitution is one type of remedy in response to an act of aggression is to try to restore the victim to his previous status. Now, in the case of an act of simple theft, you can approximate that by returning the item stolen. But you can, even in that case, you can never achieve true restitution because you can never restore the victim to the position he would have been in, which is that he never had, would have had trespass committed. So you can never undo any crime, which is why we're against it. Um, in all other types of crimes, like murder, assault and battery, uh, rape, burglary, etc., um, restitution to me seems to be a vanishing chimera. I mean, it's almost nonsensical. To me, the primary, so in other words, in one sense, justice is impossible to achieve once crime has been committed. The only true justice is to have no crime. Once justice, once the crime is committed, then the second question is, what is the victim entitled to do? Because then that is what is due to him. So then justice would be letting him do whatever he has the right to do. And then the libertarian answer, in my view, would be the, the pro proportionality idea of Rothbard which is basically that, or the lex talionis of the Old Testament. Basically, in principle, the victim is entitled to do to the criminal what was done to him as a rough measure of justice. Whether the, whether the, criminal wants to, uh, whether the victim wants to do this or not is up to him. Um, as a practical matter, most criminals are low lives and have no assets. Okay? So you're not going to be able to count on getting a monetary award from the criminal, even if you enslave them and hire them out to some company. We know slavery is not that efficient anyway, and et cetera. So I think as a practical matter, in a free society, crime would be low, and it, pre preventance, uh, you know, preventing crime would be what people would focus resources on, including their insurance companies. And people would have insurance. You know, If your house is broken into and your insurance company can't find the guy or get money from him, they would pay you, and then that would give them an incentive to stop it. Um, but as a practical matter, I think in theory, you know, if someone murders your, one of your family members, you catch the guy, in theory, you have the right to basically kill them. Uh, that's uh, punishment. My, my view is that in a, in a, in a free society um, that all forms of punishment would be more costly as a general matter than some kind of damages payment, finding some kind of way that the, that the aggressor can integrate himself back into society, find forgiveness, try to make amends, even though he can never pay full restitution, and in fact, full restitution is never possible anyway. Um, for these reasons, I believe that, it, uh, like most private defense agencies, would probably tend to resort to physical punishment um, as sort of a last resort or be a more, a more expensive measure. Um, and so ostracism and other measures would be resorted to to keep these marginal criminals um, at bay.